Welcome everybody to First Wednesday here at Brownell. We have a number of people to thank um, this evening, underwriters. Um, statewide underwriters are the Vermont Department of Libraries and the National Life Group Foundation. The underwriter of this talk is the Husky Injection Molding Systems, Inc. And then locally, the local sponsors, um, library underwriters, our Brownell Library Foundation, already mentioned, Colford Overton Wilson, PC, the Essex Agency Incorporated, Northfield Savings Bank, and RETN. Tonight we welcome Richard Wolfson, who is the Benjamin F. Whistler Professor of Physics at Middlebury College. He also teaches environmental studies. And I love his very renaissance range of interests in his academic background. He holds a BA in physics and philosophy from Swarthmore, a master's um, in environmental studies from the University of Michigan, and a PhD in physics from Dartmouth. So that's pretty well-rounded and ideal for the humanities landscape. His research involves the sun, climate change, and solar energy. And he's made something of a specialty of making somewhat obscure science accessible to the lay person. Uh, several of his books, Nuclear Choices, A Citizen's Guide to Nuclear Technology, and Simply Einstein, Relativity Demystified, exemplify this interest. He's also written textbooks and a number of articles for Scientific American also teaches video courses for the teaching company, Great Courses Program. Tonight's topic is Einstein in a nutshell, if that can actually happen. And so we, we welcome Richard Wolfson. So thank you for coming. I um, just wanted you to get a listen at that sound. We'll talk about it in a minute. Um, <clears throat> I'm mostly happy to be here, but unfortunately, I'm missing the first Wednesday's, pres Wednesday's presentation in Middlebury, which is Robert Siegel of NPR. So if I weren't here, I would <laughs> happily be there. Uh, but I'm very delighted to be here, and I'm delighted so many of you have come. Um, you are not going to get the talk I signed up for, though. The talk I signed up for back in June when I was invited to come here was my standard talk on Einstein in a nutshell in which I take you in the course of an hour to understand the really essential idea behind Einstein's relativity and why some of the bizarre things you may have heard of that happen to space and time have to be true. I'm going to cram that part into about the first 20 minutes and I'm not going to get to some of those bizarre things. And the reason I've changed my topic a bit is because of all the news that you've probably heard about discoveries out there in the universe, particularly involving gravitational waves, that have happened since I signed up in June to give this talk. So I'm going to change my emphasis to talk about what's been happening in these gravitational waves. And that's why I put in the 100 years of relativity. Relativity theory was first uh, conceived in 1905, so that's 112 years ago. But general relativity came out in 1916, so that's just about 100 years ago. And that's what I'm going to be emphasizing. So you were hearing something unusual. And now the question is, uh, what are you seeing and at the same time hearing? Well, you're hearing gravitational waves. And I just want to give you a sense of the news on gravitational waves. And this is very new news. This is just at most a couple of years old. So here's an uh, article in the New York Times in February 11th, 2016. So that's uh, not even two years ago. Uh, it's the first announcement of the discovery of gravitational waves, sometime that, something that Einstein had predicted just about 100 years ago. So that was in 2016. Uh, June 5th, 2016, a few months later, uh, the scientists heard a second of these gravitational wave signatures from colliding black holes. More about that to come. Um, June 1st of this year, we got a third signature of 
uh, gravitational waves from black holes emerging three billion light years away. And gee, I thought that was pretty much the end of it. Um, but then uh, this new detection of gravitational waves did more than just detect something. It opened a whole new window of astronomy because it allowed us to study in detail what was going on in this bizarre system three billion light years away. And I thought, well, that is surely the end of it. And I actually gave a talk on this subject in early October in Middlebury. And I thought, well, that was clearly the end of it. But then the Nobel Prize was awarded the day before I gave that talk in Middlebury. And the Nobel Prize, to nobody's surprise, was awarded for this discovery of the gravitational waves. And I thought, well, that's surely the end of it. Uh, but it wasn't the end of it, because October 16th, we have this news uh, that LIGO, the, the, the gravitational wave detector, which I'll describe shortly, detect this collision of neutron stars for the first time. And what the cosmic crash confirmed was that Einstein was as good as gold. Now, I happen to be wearing a gold wedding ring. My spouse is over there somewhere. She disappeared. There she is. And by the way, uh, patrons of this library, she has just bought four bags of books from your library because she's a librarian. So she's, she's supporting your, your organization. Uh, and and uh, what we know from this event that just was announced two weeks ago is that the gold in my ring and your ring and any gold you have on you was forged in the collision of two neutron stars. And we just learned this from this result of general relativity. So that, all that made me rethink my topic here, and I'm going to try to talk about this. But before I get there, I have to tell you two things. I have to tell you how we detected these gravitational waves, and then I'll get to what they are. But then I do still have to give you Einstein's relativity in the briefest of nutshells possible. So let's go. Uh, so here are the gravitational wave detectors that are at the heart of this news, detecting these gravitational waves. LIGO stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And in the United States, there are two of them, one in Livingston, Louisiana, one in Hanford, Washington. There's the Livingston one. Here it is closer up. Here's the Hanford, Washington one. There's a reason they're across the continent from each other. There's now a third one operating in Italy. This is a diagram of what's in them, and I'm not going to spend much time on that, except to point out that these things shoot laser beams down these two perpendicular arms. They're each about two and a half miles long. The laser beams bounce back and forth many times, so the path is actually much longer. And they look for very subtle differences in the length of the path traveled by those laser beams. So I'll say a little bit more about that. But before I do, let me just point out what we're looking at. We're looking here in these signals at the merger of two black holes billions of light years away. That's a good way to the 10%, 20% of the way to the beginning of the universe. And here's a computer simulation, not a photograph, uh, of black holes merging. And you can see them. And they're going around each other. And they go faster and faster at the end. And that corresponds to those rapid wiggles and to the uptick in the pitch of that sound. And then they've merged into one black hole. And they've kind of settled down. So there's the merger of two black holes. So what are these gravitational waves? Well, they are essentially ripples in the very fabric of space-time. More to say about space-time. They were first predicted by Einstein in 2016. They're produced by the motions of extremely massive objects, of which black holes are the most massive, compact objects we know of in the universe. And they alter the lengths. Remember those arms that were two and a half miles long? They altered those lengths by a thousandth of the diameter of a proton. And a proton is about a thousandth of a trillionth of a meter in diameter. Maybe a hundredth of a trillionth of an inch. That's pretty small. And it's a thousandth of that. And these things, and we have to detect that. And so here's sort of a, a picture of what it might look like. Two massive objects going around, and space-time is getting rippled the way water gets rippled when you throw stones into it or stir it with a paddle or something. So how on earth do you measure these very small changes? Well, you exploit a property of light, namely, the, or if any kind of wave, but light in particular, which says that waves interfere. And what that means is this. If I have two light waves, and they, or any kind of waves, sound waves, whatever, and they happen to be, or ocean waves, they happen to be in step with each other, and they happen to be in the same place, they will make a bigger wave. They will simply add up, and that's called constructive interference. The waves have added up because they're both in the same place, and the peak of one wave lines up with the peak of the other wave, and they get a big, make a bigger wave. On the other hand, they could be lined up like this, so the peak of one wave lines up with the trough of another wave, the low point of the other wave, and then they wipe each other out, and that's called destructive interference. And that's about all I want to say about that. 
But here's a device that exploits it. And remarkably, if I were doing my original talk, I'd spend more time on this device called a Michelson interferometer because it was invented in the 1800s by Michelson at what is now Case Western Reserve University. And uh, he developed this device to try to discover something about the motion of the Earth through the universe that scientists expected to see. And they didn't see it. And that led to Einstein's relativity. But this looks almost exactly like those pictures I showed you of those LIGO detectors. They had these two arms where laser beams bounced back and forth. And they are, in fact, versions of this device that Michelson invented that led to the original relativity theory or helped lead to it. And what we're seeing when we look in one of these devices that is shooting a source of light these days, it's always a laser, down to one mirror, down to the other mirror, back and forth. The light becomes recombined. And we see these patterns of light, dark, light, dark, light, dark. The light is where the interference is constructive. The dark is where it's destructive. And if the path length of one of these paths changes a little bit, that pattern will shift. And it will shift a tiny amount. But that amount is, that, that small amount allows us to measure distances which are very, very small. That's how we measure a thousandth of the diameter of a proton. So I don't want you to walk out of here understanding and being able to explain this device. But I do want you to understand that we have a way of measuring what sound like impossibly small changes in distance. We do it using the interference of light. And the LIGO detectors are exactly the same thing, except they have two and a half mile long arms. Michelson and Morley did this with uh, about um, uh, 10 feet long arms on a great big slab of stone floating in liquid mercury. OSHA would never allow it today. Um, but here's that device. And that, that's what that equals, basically. Um, there are about 300 reflections in each of these arms. So effectively, they're 700 miles long. And the longer you make them, the more sensitive they can be. Um, and we have two distant reflectors, one in Louisiana and one in Washington, because if a passing truck goes by five miles away on a highway, it's going to vibrate this thing enough to make a bigger signal than any black holes three billion light years away are going to make. So we want to rule out the trucks on the Louisiana highway or the uh, water in the Columbia River falling over a waterfall at Hanford, Washington. And the way we do that is by having two detectors thousands of miles apart. And now we've got the third one in Italy. And we look only for signals that are simultaneous or almost simultaneous. And those are the only ones we consider. So there's how we do the detection of gravitational waves. Now we've got to get to relativity and then into what gravitational waves are. So hang on. Here's relativity in a real nutshell. Um, relativity basically says this. It says mo motion doesn't matter. Have you ever been in an airplane and you've been dozing and you know the airplane is flowing through perfectly smooth air? Or maybe you've been on the ferry boat across Lake Champlain. Or maybe you've just been sitting as a passenger in a car going down a smooth highway. And you really can't tell that you're moving. There's nothing about what you feel that says you're moving. If the ride gets bumpy, if there's turbulence in the airplane, if you're on a cruise ship and the sea gets rough, you understand that. But the motion itself, you can't detect. My students have just do, been doing an experiment this week in the elevators in Middlebury Science Center. And part of the experiment is to convince them that when the elevator is moving smoothly up or down, they can't tell. They can't tell which way it's going. They can't tell that it's going at all. Motion doesn't matter. That's really all relativity says. Another way to put that is the universe works the same way for everyone, regardless of their state of motion. The laws of physics put it in terms of what we physicists like to talk about, they don't depend on your state of motion. And this is that single English language sentence that I advertised in my abstract was the essence of relativity. If somebody says, do you understand relativity? You say, yes. All it says is the laws of physics don't depend on your state of motion. They're the same for everyone. And I want to convince you of that with some experiments. So I would claim, you know, do a physics experiment. I would claim this is a physics experiment. Throw a tennis ball up and it comes down. Or for those of you who are tennis people, you know, play the whole game of tennis. There's a lot of complicated physics in tennis, but it's all about the laws of physics. So if you do this experiment right here in this room, works fine. The ball goes up, the ball comes down. If I'm in, on a cruise ship sailing through calm water, and I'm indoors on the cruise ship, so there's no wind associated with the cruise ship's motion, and I do this experiment, guess what happens? Same thing. I do this on an airplane flying through smooth air at 600 miles an hour. It works the same way. I think you can see that. So here are several examples. You do that experiment on Earth, 
playing tennis is an experiment with physics. And it comes out the same way as if you were on a cruise ship. You could even imagine doing that experiment on Venus, and I picked Venus because it's our sister planet, same size as Earth, same mass, has basically the same gravity, so tennis is going to work the same way. We've got to do it maybe in a big bubble tennis court so we don't get crushed by the heavy atmosphere of Venus, and it would work the same way, even though Venus is moving relative to Earth at tens of miles every second. But if you're playing tennis on Venus, you'll think, wait a minute. You know, uh, my, my partner is moving at, at, at 50 miles a second relative. I've got to compensate for that. Even on the cruise ship, hey, my partner is facing the bow and I'm facing the stern. I've got to figure all that out. No, you don't have to think about that. It works the same way. And even if you went to an Earth-like planet in a very distant galaxy, billions of light years away, moving rapidly away from Earth at 50, 70, 80 percent of the speed of light, you, a modern 21st century person, would probably believe that the tennis ball would still work. If you think, oh, there's something so special about Earth that only works on Earth, Copernicus would be turning over in his grave. Mm -hmm. So th this is pretty obvious. And it was obvious to Newton and to Galileo also. And it's still the essence of relativity. So the essence of Einstein's theory was something that Newton and Galileo already knew. But at the end of the 1800s, in the 1700s and 1800s, a whole other branch of physics was discovered. And this is a little bit hard for us 21st century people to accept. Physicists believed that, that the laws of that physics weren't quite as simply described as the tennis ball. But I think I can convince you that they would be, uh, that, that would work the same way. And those are the laws of electricity and magnetism one of whose phenomena is light, because light is a wave of electricity and magnetism. So let's go back and do these experiments again. You're done with your tennis game, and you're going to have a cup of tea. So you throw the cup of tea in the microwave oven, not the best way to make tea, but you do that. And you know how you press 30 seconds four times or something to make uh, however many minutes, four minutes, two minutes, or whatever, and you boil your tea. Right? We all know how microwave ovens work. But a microwave oven is an electromagnetic device, not a mechanical thing like me throwing a ball up and down. If I did that on a cruise ship, I would kind of expect my tea to work the same way. If I did it on Venus, even though Venus is moving at 50 miles a second or something relative, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect that to mess up the microwave. I mean, do I have to worry about, oh, the microwaves are coming out here, and they're going the wrong, then you know, they get left behind or something. I don't have to worry about that. And I would warrant that a 21st century person familiar with microwave ovens would imagine that if you transported that microwave oven to a distant planet on a distant galaxy, it would still work the same way. And if you believe that of both the tennis ball and the microwave oven, then you believe that of all realms of physics, it's true that your motion doesn't matter. And if you believe that, you believe Einstein's theory of relativity because that's all there is to it. At the end of the 1800s, physicists did not believe the microwave oven thing would work. And they set out to try to find out the differences, and that's what the Michelson interferometer was invented to do, and it couldn't do it because there was no difference, and that's what led Einstein to postulate his ideas of relativity. Now, here's what I can't do, which, what I would have done in my original talk. I would have pointed out that one aspect of electromagnetism one result of these laws of physics is that there are waves of electricity and magnetism, and they include light. And so light was discovered to be an electrical and magnetic phenomenon. And the laws of physics predict a speed for that light, about 186,000 miles a second. And if you believe what we just did with the microwave oven experiment, you have to accept that everybody measures that same speed for light, even when they're moving relative to each other. So I'm, you know, I'm in the airplane going by at 600 miles an hour, and I measure 186,000 miles a second exactly for that speed of light, and you measure it too, even though you're on the ground. And I go whizzing by you in a spaceship at three quarters of the speed of light, and I still measure the same speed for light. And if you start scratching your head and thinking, how can that possibly be? That's hard to get your head around. And that can only be if our notions, our common sense notions of space and time are not as simple as we thought they were. That's why relativity is complicated, because it screws up our common sense notions of space and time. Space and time are different than we thought they were. They're more flexible. They're more fluid. 
And I will say more about that, but I won't go into the details of how Einstein's first theory of relativity gets us to that. That's what I would have done had I not got all excited about gravitational waves. <laughs> So uh, relativity in a nutshell says motion doesn't matter. Universe works the same way for everyone. The laws of physics don't depend on your state of motion. Now, there are two relativity theories. In 1905, Einstein came up with his first theory, which is restricted only to people who are moving uniformly. They're moving along at a constant speed in a straight line. They're not accelerating. Their motion isn't changing, like the airplane flying through smooth air or the cruise ship sailing through smooth seas or the experiment on Venus moving smoothly along in its orbit. It does overthrow our common sense notions of space and time, as I said. Then, 10 years later, Einstein comes up with the general theory of relativity and took him a long time to get to that because it's a much more complicated theory for reasons that I will describe. But it removes that restriction. It makes physics work in any state of motion no matter what. That's why it's called the general theory. The special theory is called special, not because it's special and wonderful. I mean, it is. But it's specialized to the special case. And the general theory is even more general. It says no matter what your state of motion, whirling around on a merry-go-round, uh, blasting off in a rocket ship, uh, swimming under the ocean, whatever you're doing, even if you're accelerating, even if your motion is changing, we can make physics look the same for you as it does for everybody else. So I want to spend the rest of my talk on general relativity. And I want to give you a, just the slightest hint of where it came from in Einstein's mind how we know it's true, how we used to know it was true before the modern era, and then how we know it's true now and where these gravitational waves come from. So here are some issues. Special relativity is, first of all, restricted to this special case of uniform motion that is smooth, unchanging, constant speed, straight line motion. So it's restricted, and we'd like to be more general. Uh, why should your state of motion matter at all? Why not the laws of physics are the same for everyone, period? That's what general relativity sets out to do. It sets out to generalize special relativity so it's true for everyone. But there are some issues. There are issues, first of all, with Einstein's special relativity. First of all, it turns out to be philosophically difficult to tell for sure if you're in uniform motion. I'm not going to go into that, but it is difficult. Um, it's difficult. Well, I'll show you why it's difficult in a minute. Uh, there are also problems with gravity, as Newton came up with it. Newton had a wonderful theory of gravity. He said the Earth reaches out and pulls on the moon far away, and the moon responds by going around in this nice circular orbit. Or the Earth reaches out. I'm going to talk on this in my class on, on Friday. Uh, the Earth reaches out, pulls the apple from the tree, falls to the ground. Newton's genius was to realize that the motion of the apple and the motion of the moon were the same motion caused by the same force, namely gravity. But the problem is. Um, Newtonian gravity is supposed to act instantaneously. The moon knows right now that the Earth is pulling on it. In fact, if the Earth suddenly disappeared, according to Newton, the moon instantly ought to go off in a straight line because it's no longer being pulled by gravity to just maintain its circular orbit. But Einstein doesn't like anything to happen instantaneously. Einstein says no information can travel faster than this special magic speed, the speed of light. So something wrong with Newtonian gravity in the context of relativity. Um, and first of all, and the other thing is the gravitational force depends on how far apart objects are. The moon is a lot farther from the Earth than the International Space Station, so it's subject to a much weaker force. But in a theory that screws up our common sense notions of distance, distance is different for different observers in different states of motion. And so whose distance do you use? And there's an ambiguity there. That's a problem. And here's the biggest problem. The biggest problem is what happens when you talk about motion that isn't uniform, motion that's accelerated, which is just what you're trying to do to get to a general theory of relativity that says, let's describe the universe so that it works the same way for everyone. And the problem is you can't tell acceleration from gravity. I want to tell you a little bit more about that, which give you some graphical examples of it. First, I want to tell you what Einstein said about it. Einstein discovered this idea in 1907. He called it the happiest thought of his life. <clears throat> it's also called the principle of equivalence. It's related to what Galileo discovered when he dropped two objects off the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And what did he discover? 
They fell at the same rate. They accelerated downward at the same rate. Gravity had the same effect on them. And that's related to this principle that Einstein is talking about. <clears throat> and so he wrote a paper on it in 1907, two years after his original paper. And uh, then he made a commentary in 19, where he said, the gravitational field has only a relative existence. He said, imagine an observer falling off the roof of a house. Not a pleasant thought, but that's what's happening. And at least in his immediate surroundings, there exists no gravitational field. I want to demonstrate what Einstein means by that. I won't go off the roof, but I will go off this stool. And right now, you all feel gravity, you think, right? You feel kind of a heaviness, right? And it's good you're sitting down in chairs. This poor guy has to stand. Uh, he's getting fatigued. And he feels it in his feet and his leg muscles and all that. That's not gravity you're feeling. That's the forces your body needs to exert to counterbalance gravity. The force most of you are feeling is the force of the chair pushing up on your butt. If that force weren't there, you would be accelerating downward on the influence of gravity. And try this experiment sometime. If you go into a so-called freely falling situation where there are no other forces acting on you but gravity, for that brief instant, you don't feel gravity. You don't feel heavy. And here's a way to look at that, a different way to look at that. Um, I'm going to, at the same time I go off the stool, I'm going to drop this tennis ball. And what do I see? You see me falling down, and you see the tennis ball falling down. What do I see? I see the tennis ball falling right with me, and therefore it just sits there beside me. I don't feel gravity, and it looks to me like there's no gravity in my situation. Now, that situation doesn't last long. Einstein uses the roof example because it takes a few more seconds, but there is a now commonplace example in which some people exist right this moment as we speak, where they're always in that situation of falling freely, that is, being under the influence of gravity alone. Who are those people I'm talking about? The occupants of the International Space Station or any orbiting spacecraft. Um, you're not, quote, weightless up there. There's not no gravity in space, despite some children's books that say that. Don't get me going on that. Some of them are good, though. Some of them don't say that. Uh, there's plenty of gravity in space. It's just the people who are up there in space are in orbit, and they're simply falling freely. That is, they're moving on the, under the influence of gravity. And they don't feel gravity. So Einstein, so, so Einstein says, um, uh, if you go into one of these freely falling situations, then you don't feel gravity. Here's some examples. Um, here I am in <clears throat> truly intergalactic space, very far from gravity. I'm in a little room, picture it in an elevator or just a, or a little tiny spaceship or something. And if I take a ball out, and there's no gravity anywhere around me, I take a ball out of my pocket and let it go, just like I did jumping off here, and uh, the ball just floats there because there's no gravity. On the other hand, if I'm freely falling, and that's the experiment I just did, in the presence of gravity, and I take the ball out of my pocket, it will fall with me. And in my little freely falling situation, I won't experience gravity. It'll look like there's no gravity. Those two situations are equivalent, and they're indistinguishable. And that's what the equivalence principle says. Another way of looking at it, a different way, is here I am at rest on Earth. And if I drop the ball, sure enough, it accelerates downward. Probably some of you know the rate at which it accelerates, but we don't need to worry about that. On the other hand, I could take and strap a little rocket motor on my elevator or spacecraft or whatever it is, and I could accelerate that way with the rocket motor. I would feel pushed to the bottom of the rocket. It would feel to me like I was feeling gravity. And if I took a ball out of my pocket and let it go, it would just continue doing what it was doing, the law of inertia, and the spacecraft would keep accelerating up toward it. And so the bottom of the spacecraft would soon hit the ball. And to me, it would look like the ball was accelerating downward. So those two situations are also completely indistinguishable. That's why it's called the principle of equivalence. And it says you can't distinguish the effects of gravity from the effects of acceleration. The effects of gravity and acceleration are indistinguishable. At least in a small enough region of space time. And the reason this is important is because Einstein wants to make a physics that is truly universal. F 
physics has to be the same for everybody, no matter what the state of motion they're in. And if I can go into a different state of motion, this state right now, and gravity isn't there, in a physics which is supposed to be truly universal, that thing that I'm used to calling gravity, I can get rid of it by going to a different state of motion. So it can't be real. And if you want to say, well, but it really is real because the people who are sitting on Earth are the real people who really judge everything right, then you're missing the point of relativity that everybody's point of view is equally good. Nothing special about Earth, nothing special about being at rest with respect to Earth or any other body. And if I can find a situation in which there isn't, doesn't seem to be gravity, and I'm truly trying to get a universal picture of physics that's true for everybody, then that can't be gravity. Well, what is gravity then? So here's a more complicated experiment. Now I'm in my same elevator, but I'm much bigger, and the elevator is much bigger. Or either that, and, and, the, and the Earth is this thing here. That's the Earth. And I'm falling toward Earth, and I take two balls out of my pocket, and I drop them. And which way do they fall? What's the D word that describes how things fall? D word. Down. But which direction is down? Toward where? Toward the center of the Earth. And it, in this big situation, you can pretty much see that the direction toward the center of the Earth for those two balls is not exactly the same. If you've ever driven across the Verrazano Bridge, you know, that what is it, connects Staten Island to New Jersey or somewhere? Um, the two, tops of those two towers are a few inches farther apart than the bottoms. And they were engineered that way because they're both vertical. They're both perfectly vertical. They both align down to the center of the Earth. But because the Earth is curved, they're like that. And the same thing is happening here. And so those balls are going to fall toward the center of the Earth. And notice how far apart they are there. A little while later, we're further down. They were that far apart. Now they're closer together. By the way, notice what's happened to me. Let's go back. I'm the passenger. Look at me. Look at me there, and look at me there, and tell me what's happened. My arms have gotten shorter, but what else has happened? My body has gotten longer. Think, keep that in mind when we talk about gravitational waves affecting these big LIGO detectors. Now, that effect cannot be transformed away by going into free fall. That effect of those balls moving slightly closer together that's not due to gravity itself. It's due to differences in gravity from place to place. Newton knew about this, and he called those tidal forces because they're what's responsible for the tides. The tides aren't caused by gravity. They're caused by gravity being stronger on the moonward side of the Earth and weaker on the far side and in between where the Earth itself is. That's why we have two tides a day, one bulging toward the moon, one away from the moon as that ocean is left behind. Newton knew about this, called them tidal forces. Well, Einstein capitalized on this, and he said, the principle of equivalence holds all objects fall with the same acceleration. And for that reason, you can't distinguish the effects of gravity from those of acceleration. Uh, but you don't feel gravity in a freely falling reference frame, as I demonstrated by jumping off that stool. So what, here's what gravity isn't. Gravity is not. Something, it can't be something that's present in one frame, but not another. You guys all say you feel gravity, but I don't while I'm in free fall. And so gravity can't be the thing you feel and I don't if we truly believe we ought to be able to make a description of the universe that holds equally well for everyone. So that's what gravity isn't. You don't feel gravity in a freely falling reference frame. So what you're all feeling as gravity, the big heaviness, that can't be objectively real. So what is gravity? Well, Einstein seizes on these tidal forces, the things that Newton would have called differences from gravity from place to place, and he makes them the real manifestation of gravity. But he can't say, well, they're due to differences in gravity from place to place, because that gravity that there are the differences in doesn't exist, according to him. Because it can't be objectively real, because you don't feel it in certain frames of reference, freely falling ones. So here's what he says. He says, what is gravity? Um, it's simply the geometry of space and time put together to make what we call space time. It's a simple thing. It's the geometry of space time, but space and time. Space is not what simple as you thought it was. It can warp and bend. So can time. Um, for, and space time is four dimensional. It's curved. What curves it? 
matter and energy curve it. The presence of matter and also energy, because E equals mc squared says those are equivalent, um, that's what curves space-time. That's what causes space-time to be curved. Absent any matter or energy, space-time would be what we, our common sense notions think of. But that would be a pretty dull universe. We wouldn't be in it for, un for one thing. Um, so how do objects move? That's a big question for physics. Well, they move in the straightest possible paths in this curved space-time. Just like if you fly from here to Europe, what's the straightest path you take? You go over, you go over Greenland, at least. You go pretty far north. And if you look on a globe, you understand immediately why that is. The globe is a curved surface, and the straightest lines, the shortest paths, are not perfectly straight, but they are these great circle curves that are parts of a diameter of the Earth. Well, it's the same thing in general relativity. The name for those paths is geodesics, and the, locally they're straight lines. But if you look at the larger scale of things, they are curves in this curved space-time. So general relativity in a nutshell says matter and energy tell space-time how to curve, and curve space-time then gives matter its, quote, marching orders, tells it how to move. That's a quote from the great physicist uh, John Archibald Wheeler. Uh, and you will often see pictures, including in my book Simply Einstein, where we try to attempt to get you to understand how the curvature of space-time could lead to these motions. So here's a picture of a massive object you could imagine a great heavy ball sitting on a rubber sheet. We have a demonstration of this back at the college, but I didn't bring it. And you could imagine trying to roll some smaller balls around on that curved surface. And you can see this one coming in from afar is going to just get deflected a little bit. But this one is going to go around and around in a closed orbit. By the way, there was just news about this one two nights ago. It was the news that we had just detected an object in the solar system that had come from outside the solar system. Did anyone see that news item? Uh, that was an object like this, and it's the first time one has been detected in the solar system. It's coming through the solar system, getting deflected slightly, but it's going too fast to be captured by the solar system. These diagrams are interesting, but they're really misrepresentations because I'm thinking, gosh, the Earth must really curve space-time a lot if the moon is trapped in this circular orbit around it. So a better way to think of that is to remember that we're talking about curved space and curved time. And if I tried to draw the orbit of the Earth in, whoops, in space, so here this, this gray square is sort of a two-dimensional representation of the space around the solar system, and the Earth goes around and around and around the sun, for example. But it also moves through time. It moves into the future. And it moves into the future. Every year, it moves one year into the future. Every year, it goes around once in its orbit. And so the path of the Earth in space-time is not just a circle. It's a spiral like this. You think, well, that still looks like pretty curved space-time to make that spiral. But the Earth advances one year in time as it goes around its orbit once. And the comparison we ought to make is, how far does it go? measured in light years, the distance light travels in one year, versus how far it goes in time, namely one year. And the answer is not very far, because it takes light eight minutes to go from the sun to the earth, 2 pi r, 8, 16, I know, 2 pi, but it's going to be something like 30 light minutes around in its orbit, something like that if I did the calculation right. It's nowhere near a light year. And so the real picture looks more like this, or even more extreme, and the path of the Earth through curved space-time around the sun is actually almost a straight line, very, very small spiral, because we're moving so fast through time and so little through space. So that's a better picture. Now, Newton made us a theory of gravity that worked really well. Didn't, doesn't differ much from Einstein's in regions where gravity is weak. Um, so either theory works really well in regions where gravity is weak. And I'll say it right now. Gravity is weak everywhere in our solar system. You may not think that if you're the person falling off the roof and going to get smashed some bones when you hit the ground. But gravity in the solar system is weak. And I'll show you in a minute just what I mean by that. The only time you will ever notice the difference is if you make extremely sensitive measurements. And I've got a device in my pocket, and probably most of you do, that can actually make very sensitive measurements. It's a GPS receiver on my phone. And the GPS measurements are so precise, they can pinpoint whether I'm on this side of the room or that side of the room. 
uh, that we really need to take into account general relativity in calculating the orbits of the GPS satellites, or by the end of the day, they'd be off by a mile or something. It's the one, one of the very few places where we notice that difference. Now, for most of the 20th century, and I grew up learning physics in the 1960s and 70s, uh, that was sort of the tail end of the time in which our only real ability to prove all these ideas of Einstein's rested on three very carefully precise measurements that weren't all that interesting. The first one is what was called the precession of the perihelion of Mercury. It turns out that the orbit of Mercury goes around and doesn't quite close on itself. And this was not explained. Astronomers couldn't figure it out. Maybe there's a new planet between the Mercury and the Sun. They had all kinds of explanations. You can see the orbit going around not quite closing. And as soon as Einstein produced general relativity in 1916, he said, look, it leads to this quite naturally. It's a very tiny effect. It's a tiny fraction of a degree every century. But astronomers can measure that. So that was known right when Einstein published general relativity. And that was a confirmation. Another was the bending of light. Here's uh, the Einstein's general relativity because it talks about gravity as being space and time being curved. Even light follows curved paths through space time. So here we are on Earth looking at a star, and we look straight at the star and we see it. But here we are on Earth at a time of year when the sun is on the path between us and that star, and light leaving the star, if Einstein is correct, follows a curved path, and we look in a slightly different direction to see that star. Now, unfortunately, you can't do that experiment because the sun is awfully bright, except when? During an eclipse. And there was a famous eclipse in 1919, and this experiment was done. There's a lot of interesting history there. I don't have time to go into it. Here is this New York Times headline, men of science more or less agog over eclipse observations. Einstein triumphed. Stars were not where they seemed to be nor calculated, but nobody need worry. Um, and finally, there's something called gravitational time dilation, which basically says time runs slower where gravity is stronger. And astronomical observations of light from very dense collapsed stars, things that are about the mass of the sun crammed into the Earth's size, they're called white dwarfs, verified that, as did a really sensitive, clever experiment that was done in a 60-foot tall stairwell at Harvard University. And they could actually measure the difference in timing that was going on down at the bottom versus at the top with some very sensitive measurements. So for most of the 20th century, those were the three classical tests that say, hey, this general relativity is right, but you know, it's not all that interesting. I went back to graduate school. I was teaching high school in New Hampshire and went back to graduate school partly because right about that time, um, which was the early 1970s, this whole picture began to change and general relativity began to become something that described a universe we were actually seeing. And to understand that, we have to look at the difference between weak and strong gravity. I argued that gravity is very weak everywhere in our solar system. Now, what do I mean by that? Suppose I take this ball and throw it up, what happens? It comes back down. Suppose I throw it higher, it comes back down. Does what goes up always come down? Ooh, she knows a fancy term. So there's something which any first year physics student could calculate. My students are going to do this next week in which you ask, is there a speed I could throw this ball at so that if the ceiling weren't in the way and the air weren't there, it would never come back? And the answer is there is. And for the Earth, anyone know what it is for the Earth? It's about seven miles a second for the Earth. Now, that may sound fast. You know, none of those cars out on 89 are going seven miles a second. They might be going one mile a minute, but that's a lot slower. Sounds really fast. But we have sent things off Earth at escape speed. We have even sent things, the Voyager spacecraft, are traveling through space at escape speed relative to the sun. And they will never come back to the solar system for that reason. But those speeds are still tiny compared to the speed of light, because it's how fast? 186,000 miles a second. So is it true or false what goes up must come down? No, because of escape speed. Um, and for Earth, it's about seven miles a second. For the sun, it's about 400 miles a second. But those are still much less than the speed of light to which we give the symbol C. And that is the criterion for saying gravity in the solar system is weak. There's nowhere in the solar system where to escape to it infinitely far away, it would take speeds anywhere near the speed of light. And that's what I mean when I say gravity in the solar system is weak. Or to put it in terms of Einstein, space-time in the region of the solar system is only slightly curved. 
Strong gravity occurs where escape speed approaches C. And the ultimate strong gravity, and these are the things, space time is very strongly curved, these are the things that were being discovered just as I was teaching high school and deciding to go back to graduate school. Uh, they were neutron stars, which are objects about the mass of the sun collapsed into about the size of Essex Junction, mm -hmm. a few miles across. Um, they were discovered, and then black holes were discovered. When I was doing my PhD, black holes were still very speculative. Did they really exist or not? Well, today we know they exist, and they are all over the universe in many places. Um, but they're the ultimate strong gravity. The escape speed for a black hole is C, the speed of light, and that's why nothing can escape it, even light, and that's why it's a black hole. A neutron star is almost that small, but not quite. Remember, those are the things we just detected two weeks ago, smashing together and making our wedding rings or some future thing's wedding ring. So I want to spend the last five or 10 minutes talking about uh, the modern manifestations of general relativity in black holes and ultimately in gravitational waves that we've detected. So we know there are black holes. Um, there are black holes, the most common ones we know of, and the ones we first discovered were black holes in binary star systems. A binary star system is a system of two stars that are in orbits around each other. Our sun is actually rather unusual in being a solitary star. Uh, and when these stars get very close, gas can flow from one star to the other, and the other star can collapse, or maybe it blows up and becomes a supernova and collapses and makes a black hole. And um, when I was in graduate school, one of the things I was studying was, in fact, that transfer of gas into making black holes. And we were just looking at systems that might or might not be black holes. Now, now we know they are. We also know there are black holes at the centers of galaxies. At the center of our galaxy is a relatively tame black hole with a mass several million times the mass of the sun. But some other galaxies have black holes with billions of times the mass of the sun, and stuff is falling into them all the time. And although nothing can come out of the black hole, on the way in, the stuff can get really hot and glow and give off light. And here are some examples. Here's a, a sort of artist's conception of a black hole at a galactic center. These are actual orbits. Uh, done from astronomical observations of stars that are moving extremely rapidly very near the center of our own galaxy, the Milky Way. And the implication of that is there must be a very massive object that we can't see and that is very, very small, very tiny, because it doesn't take up any visible amount of space and the only uh, thing we know of that could be that is a black hole and that we can measure the mass of the black hole. And uh, again, over here, here you see uh, in 1995, here you see some of these uh, black hole, um, these pictures of black hole, of, of these pictures of the, the motions of the stars. And here's a, a movie showing the motions based on observations taken from 1995 to about 2015, 16 uh, of the motions of those stars plotted. And there they are going around and that star thing right there marks probably where the central black hole in our galaxy is. So we now know there are black holes. They're in binary star systems, they're in galactic centers, and uh, there may even be primordial black holes that were formed somehow in the Big Bang, but we haven't detected those yet. I will say that the detection of these gravitational waves with black holes in the range of 30 sun masses is pushing the limit of what we thought star size black holes could be. So it's possible these are some other population of black holes that we don't know about yet. It's possible they came from stars. They're very, they're very near the upper limit, though. And I think a lot of astrophysicists were surprised at how massive those things were. So those are black holes. And maybe there are even some other kinds of black holes. Maybe the ones we're seeing colliding with our gravitational wave detection are among them. Um, so general relativity is now really at the forefront of modern astrophysics and cosmology. There's something called the binary pulsar that a guy named Joe Taylor, who was then at the University of Massachusetts, discovered way back in the 1970s. It was two neutron stars in very close orbit. Its precession, that thing that Mercury was doing, was very obvious. You only had to observe it for a few months to see that. They observed it for 20 years, and they observed carefully, very carefully, the orbits of these things, and they discovered that the orbits were changing in a way that was consistent with it losing energy by radiating away these gravitational waves. So in a sense, they discovered gravitational waves, but they didn't actually detect them, but they discovered something that was happening that could only be explained by the existence of gravitational waves. And uh, Taylor and his colleague won the Nobel Prize for that event quite a while ago. The energy loss was consistent with gravitational waves. Um, another thing we're seeing now is the equivalent of the bending of light with what we call gravitational lenses. So light from distant objects passes near something like a massive galaxy, and the light is bent. 
And it's much more dramatic than what happened with the 1919 eclipse in our solar system, because now we get actually multiple images of the object. And now we're using this not to study general relativity, but rather as a tool to study the universe. We can detect dark mass of objects that you couldn't otherwise see by their effect on light of more distant objects. We can actually use massive clusters of galaxies as giant telescopes that magnify stuff that's way out in the distant universe that we couldn't otherwise see. And right here in our own galaxy, we can use so-called microlensing events as a planet passes in front of a star, and the light from the star is temporarily bent a little bit around that planet to de make detections of planets. And it's used in cosmology to study, study the distribution of the so-called dark matter that we don't know what it is, but we know it constitutes most of the matter in the universe. So let me give you a picture of one of these gravitational lenses to see how it works. So here I have a quasar, which is just a very ancient galaxy with a huge black hole in it. Actually, it's not so ancient. It's just very far away. It's got a big black hole in it. Here's a nearer galaxy, and here's Earth. And we're going to observe light from that quasar. And like the light I showed you from the uh, sun in that eclipse, light leaving the quasar in this direction is bent by the massive curvature of space-time caused by that massive galaxy. It comes to Earth this way. But it could equally well go this way. And so somebody on Earth can look in two different directions, that way or that way, and see the same thing. It's there. It's there. And if you think about the symmetry, if that situation were perfectly symmetric, and I can't do this in three dimensions on the screen, um, somebody who was looking that way would see light that was coming that way. And you might see a whole ring instead of the object if it was perfectly symmetric, which it usually isn't. But here's a beautiful example. This is a system called the Einstein cross, aptly named. Um, what you're seeing here are five stars but they aren't stars, they're five images of the same object, the same distant quasar. Um, it's about nine billion light years away, so we're seeing it as it was in quite early in the age of the universe. Um, and the galaxy that we, that is sort of some of this haziness is due to a galaxy that's between us and that distant object, and that galaxy is about 500 million light years away, about half a billion light years away. And if we look at this really close up, this is called microlensing. Uh, this is actually the Einstein cross, the individual images being further lensed by stars, individual stars in that galaxy passing in front of them and making some of them brighter at different times and, and so on. Here's uh, 1991, here's 1994. Things have changed because of the motions of stars within that galaxy. So gravitational lensing has become a tool now for astronomers to study what's out there. Um, and here's a beautiful example. Um, the stuff that's yellow is a cluster of galaxies. There's a galaxy, there's a galaxy, there's a galaxy. Most of these things you see are galaxies, not stars, galaxies. And then they're fairly nearby, not super nearby, but somewhat nearby. And then you see these bluish things. And you could almost imagine there's an arc there. And those bluish things are images of much more distant objects that have been smeared out, almost making that arc I said you would see if the thing was perfectly symmetric. So they are smeared. They, they aren't supposed to be long and smeared out like that. They aren't supposed to be arranged this way. That's the same object as that, as that, as that, as that, as that, as that, as that. This is a Hubble Space Telescope image. Amazing, gravitational lensing. So let me end with gravitational waves. So Einstein's prediction that space-time is curved, and that's what gravity is, also leads to the prediction that if you move very massive objects around, you will create disturbances in space-time, ripples in the very fabric of space-time. And that's a picture of how that might work. So here's a binary star system going around each other, um, and they are creating these ripples in the structure of space-time. I can't draw it. Nobody can draw it because it's a, a ripple in four-dimensional space-time, not in three-dimensional space. But that's what it is. And we can detect those because as those ripples come by, they literally alter space itself and time itself. And that's what those LIGO detectors that I showed you are detecting. That's those distances on one or both of those arms changing by a small fraction of the size of a proton. And remember what happened to me when I was falling toward that Earth. What happened to my body? You remember? What happened to my arms? They got squished a little. What happened to my head and foot? 
they got pulled apart. By the way, the reason with that is my feet are closer to the Earth, so gravity's a little stronger there, so it pulls a little harder, a little less hard on my head. Well, so remember that, because what's happening in one direction is the opposite of what's happening in the other direction. And part of what the reason the LIGO detectors have these two arms is one arm is affected one way, and the other arm is affected the other way, depending on exactly how the thing is oriented. And by the way, we can tell where these gravitational waves are coming from, or roughly where they're coming from, because if the gravitational wave hits Livingston, Louisiana first, and Hanford, Washington later, we know it came on a path that took it first to Livingston and then to, and then to Hanford. So we can actually get a fix on them. And now that we've got the one in Italy running also, we can get a much better fix. Well, let me end by showing you what I think is one of the most dramatic uh, experiments, and I guess say a few more things about astronomy, and I will be done. Um, the next detector, um, which just had passed a test, there was a spacecraft up in, in, in orbit around the Earth that was testing this concept. It's a European Space Agency product. It's the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna, and it is about three million miles, five million kilometers big. So that's about 3% um, of the distance between the Earth and the Sun. This is a huge thing. It consists of three spacecraft. Well, it's not so huge. The spacecraft are you know, this big. But the whole thing, three spacecraft, each three million miles from the other. And they're bouncing laser beams back and forth at little mirror shiny objects made of gold, forged in the collisions of neutron stars, as we've just learned. Uh, they are bouncing those laser beams back, and they're much, much, much more sensitive because of that very long length. And that uh, object is due for launch in 2034, so a lot of us will not be around to see it, but it will be an exciting thing for the astronomers of that time. So we have a lot of new astronomy as a result of what we're doing with particularly gravitational waves, and I just want to take a few minutes and review a history of astronomy to see that. Um, Galileo was the first to use a tele, he didn't invent the telescope, but he was the first one to turn it to the heavens. In the 1800s, we were able to have infrared detectors that detected the invisible infrared light that comes off sort of warm but not super hot objects like visible stars. Radio astronomy came along in the 1930s when radio engineers detected m noise that was coming, ultimately they discovered, from the sun and other objects in space. A gamma ray astronomy, uh, was a um, side effect of detectors we put in space to detect nuclear explosions, and we found we were seeing nuclear explosions in space, basically, uh, events causing gamma rays, one of which was collisions of neutron stars that make gold. Um, X-ray astronomy came along in 1962, and that's the field that particularly attracted me back into my PhD. Uh, and then, and, and all those green ones, they're all basically forms of light. X-rays, gamma rays, infrared, optical, they're all forms of light. They're all electromagnetic waves. But neutrinos came along in 1968. These are subatomic particles that have almost no mass and can go right through the Earth. Very hard to detect. We learned to detect those, and we began doing those neutrino astronomy in 1968. And we did it a lot more in 1987 when a supernova went off in the Magellanic Clouds and spewed a lot of neutrinos at Earth that we could detect. And finally, our newest new astronomy is gravitational wave astronomy in 2016. So I will stop there and hope I've given you a whirlwind tour of relativity in a nutshell, and I'll be glad to take questions. And because yesterday was Halloween, I thought we'd show you how we'd cel we celebrate at Middlebury. I went up to the Middlebury College Science Center, and I discovered three, four students who had decided to dress up as the four dimensions of space-time. <laughs> I, J, K are the symbols we use for the three spatial directions. Notice they're mutually perpendicular. And time is in the background, um, just kind of hanging about because we can't really picture four dimensions in three-dimensional space. And then, as I was watching this, who wandered onto the scene but Einstein himself? And so we got this wonderful picture of Einstein and the four dimensions of space-time at Middlebury College. So, questions? Who or what agency is funding the three facilities, two in the US and one in Italy? Uh, funded largely by the European Space Agency, I believe. Um, the US ones are funded primarily by the National Science Foundation. And uh, in fact, that discovery of the neutron stars that took place in October, well, it, it was announced in October, it was taken, discovered just a little bit before that. Um, eight days later, the system went down for a year of planned upgrades. 
So it's going to get even more sensitive. So if that event had happened eight days later, we wouldn't have caught it. So the LIGO detectors are down now for about a year. And when they come back up again, they'll be much more sensitive. Um, if the budget continues yeah. to hold. Yeah. Don't get me into politics. Yeah. That's a good question. The event between the two neutron stars, which produced gravitational waves, that was the first of the now four gravitational wave detections that was not due to black holes, and that we could see the optical counterpart occurring at the same time. And so the gravitational wave signature told us for sure that this was a collision of neutron stars, and the optical signatures, including spectroscopy, showed us the radioactive decay of highly radioactive forms of these elements that were forming. So yes. So why do gravitational waves travel at the speed of light? Why do they? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, you know, you might ask, do they, first of all? And there was actually an experiment done a few years ago to confirm what everybody knew would be the case, namely that gravitational influences do propagate at the speed of light. So that if the Earth were to disappear, and I said the moon would go off in a straight line, it wouldn't do that right away. It would take about a second and a half or whatever the, yeah, that's about the distance. It takes, takes light about a second and a half to get to the moon. It, and and we, that was confirmed. But there's a more philosophically deep reason for it. And it's because the speed of light isn't really a speed. I mean, it is. But in another sense, it isn't. In a sense, um, we talk about time and space as if they're different, because we grew up sort of thinking they were different. And we measure time in seconds or hours or years. And we measure space in meters or inches or feet. Because we thought they were different things. And one thing relativity says is that they're part of this same seamless space time. And what is space for you, if I'm moving relative to you, has a time element for me, and vice versa. And so we really ought to measure them with the same units. Um, you could measure space in meters and time in meters. You could measure space in inches and time in inches. You could measure space in hours and time in hours. But the most sensible measures are years and light years or things like that. And when you do combine them like that, you recognize that the speed of light is simply a conversion factor between our measurement units for space and time. And so, yes, it is the ultimate speed, but it's more fundamental than that. It's the ultimate way information can move across the universe. And I, that doesn't answer your question fully. We knew that gravitational waves couldn't go faster than light. Because if they could, there'd be all kinds of problems for causality. I could recite a limerick. Should I recite a limerick? There was a young lady named Bright who could travel much faster than light. She departed one day on a nine, in an Einsteinian way and returned on the previous night. <laughs> and that would be possible if anything. So we knew gravitational waves couldn't go faster than sea. And the reason they go at sea is because they are fundamentally a relationship between space and time. Yeah. When I lived in the suburbs of Washington, somebody asked me, how far is from the capital? And I said, well, 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, OK, but there's an assumption there that you're going at 30 miles an hour or whatever you go at in Washington, D.C. traffic. And I say, how far are you from the sun? You say, how far am I from the sun? I say, I'm eight minutes. Eight light minutes. Yeah. Yep. But you're right. We do use time to describe distances provided a speed is understood or a conversion between space and time. Why are only the males asking questions? <laughs> you did first. Yes, you had your first question. <laughs> but you had your first question. Yeah. <laughs> questions? Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm trying to ask this because it makes me feel kind of stupid. Uh, but no question is stupid. I know that, but I'm so lost with so much of what you said. And it seems as though at one point you suggested that when you were in this elevator mm -hmm. scene thing, I thought you suggested that there wasn't gravity in there. There isn't any place where there isn't gravity. Right? You know, that's a good point. So I drew this elevator, and I said it was way off in intergalactic space, far from any galaxy, any star, anything. And I sort of hedged, well, there's no gravity out there. You're, you're absolutely right. Gravity falls off 
and gets weaker and weaker, but it never goes away completely. So we really can't get away from it completely. But we could imagine going to a place where it is negligibly small. And that would be a place in between the galaxies, way far from any massive thing. So you're absolutely right. And so that was a sort of you know, physicist idealization. OK, but then you talked about the people in the space station mm -hmm. not perceiving They don't gravity. feel gravity, right. <coughs> Yep. But, so if gravity is there, why is it that they don't perceive it? What, what happens that they don't the, And it? the reason they don't is fundamentally related to Galileo's idea that all things fall with the same acceleration. So the reason I don't feel gravity now when I'm going down is my hand, my shoulder, my backbone, my thighs, my feet, they're all falling with the same acceleration. So they don't experience any motion relative to each other. And so I don't feel any stretching or compressing of my muscles or anything like that that would give me a sense that gravity is acting on me. If different objects with different masses fell at different rates, none of that would be true. It's that remarkable fact about gravity that it acts on all objects the same way that makes that possible. And you know, you know, you're welcome to stand on the stool and jump off it and you will not feel gravity while you're doing that. And the people in the space station are just in the same situation, except instead of falling toward, to Earth, they're falling around Earth. They're deviating from the straight line path they would go in if there weren't any gravity. And they just don't happen to be on a path that ever intersects the Earth. And so they're always in that situation. And they never feel gravity. Gravity's acting on them. It's keeping them in their circular orbit. But they don't feel it. And Einstein capitalizes on that philosophically. say, well, if they don't feel it, it's not there in their reference frame, that must not be what gravity really is. Oh. And that's where he comes up with all this other stuff about space time and curvature. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Uh, I had high school physics, so I'm not sure I can ask the question. And I'm not sure if you answer the question, I can understand the answer. <laughs> <laughs> but if you have, are they called LIGO? LIGO, yeah, LIGO, yeah. And so you got in the United States, mm -hmm. and a new one in Europe. Yep. Right? And you said that you can tell the direction of the of the of the, the uh, wave by which one sees it first. Mm -hmm. How can three measuring instruments on a curved surface moving <coughs> through through in direction and rotating, mm -hmm. how can they distinguish differences in time. That, that's a good question. Um, so these, these waves are traveling at the speed of light, as we established. And so um, you could imagine a situation in which one of them is coming right on a line, toward a line between Louisiana and Hanford, Washington. That one will hit Louisiana, and we know the distance, and we know how fast light goes. And if we pick it up in Hanford at exactly that calculated time later, we'll know it was coming straight along that line. If we pick it up at some time later, but not the right time for light to have traveled between those two, we can infer that it was coming at an angle. If we pick them up at the same time, we could infer that it was coming, you know, here's, here's Louisiana, she's Louisiana, he's Washington, I'm the source of these waves. If I'm right here, they're going to see them at the same time. So that allows, it, now you raise the question, well, wait a minute, the Earth is rotating, the Earth is going around the sun, all that's happening. But remember, the Earth's going around the sun. You know how fast we're going around the sun? It's about 20 miles a second. You know, I count one, and we've gone halfway to my home in Middlebury. But so has Middlebury gone that much further, so I didn't get any. <laughs> get any. Uh, but remember, 20 miles a second is negligible compared to 186,000 miles a second. So all those motions you're worried about, the Earth going around the sun, the Earth rotating, they are so negligible that during the time the gravitational wave is going between Livingston, Louisiana, and Hanford, Washington, or Italy, those rotations have, have effectively not changed the Earth's situation at all. Yeah? When they're measuring these gravitational waves, yeah. do the gravitational waves move through the Earth? Yes. And they, 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 yep, and, they, and they actually squish, and they squish the Earth in one direction and stretch it in the other direction. 
In fact, the very first gravitational wave experiments didn't use lasers. They used great big aluminum bars about this big around and 10 feet long. And they were looking for that same effect as they went through the aluminum bars and squished them in one direction and expanded them in the other direction. Okay, so they, 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 yep, so they, the things on our surface of the Earth, the wave could come from the other side. That's right. right that, that's earth, that's right. It could come right through the Earth. And so there's an ambiguity. So if, if you two see them at the same time, I could be the source, but he could be the source because they do go right through the Earth, and they're, they lose almost no energy because their effects are so small. And so that's why they're so hard to detect. The neutrinos, by the way, also go right through the Earth, and we can detect them coming up okay. from below. Yeah? So you're talking about a number of theories that Einstein postulated 100 years ago, as other physicists have also come up with theories, I, I guess, what is it like to teach in a field where it takes 100 years to prove or possibly disprove? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I don't teach general relativity except to sort of a class of total non-scientists. And um, so we don't worry a whole lot. I mean, that, it, that is remarkable. And, but again, the discovery of gravitation or the detection of gravitational waves was the final confirmation. Everybody knew general relativity was right going into that discovery. We had all these other confirmations of it. Um, what is it like to teach in a field where it takes that long to change? Well, I would say there are plenty of other discoveries in physics that are happening a lot faster than, than that one. But you know, you raise another question. Are, is, could, general, could relativity be wrong? And many people have proposed alternatives. And about once a week, I get a 100-page thing. I used to get them in the mail. Now they get them interneted to me. Read this. It's my theory about why Einstein was wrong. Um, but you know, in all the experiments we've done, nothing so far has shown Einstein to be wrong. And everything we know has ruled out almost all the alternative theories. Other quarks or other things that move faster? Um, I don't think so. However, um, and one of my professors at Swarthmore, uh, interesting Russian fellow, was um, in a small group of physicists who believe there are particles called tachyons, mm -hmm. tachometer speed, that went faster than light but couldn't go slower. And they worked out a whole theory of these things. And these theories have been largely discredited partly because of the impact these would have on causality. But I would imagine you could turn up a few physicists who are still looking into this matter. Um, but the subatomic particles we know about, you mentioned quarks, they can only go at speeds less than light relative to us. So Star Trek has been proved? <laughs> um, there's a book by Lawrence Krauss on the physics of Star Trek, and I recommend reading it. And a lot of it is true, but some of it isn't true. And uh, the other movie, I haven't seen Interstellar. Who's seen, anyone seen Interstellar? Interstellar, there's a wormhole. They go through a wormhole and get to other parts of space time really quickly. That's possible. But that's not violating things going faster than the speed of light. It's just finding a different route through the curvature of space time. They also experience time slowing down on a very heavy planet. Yes, but they don't feel that. No. That is observed by others seeing them. Yes, and that's true. And by the way, the, the advisor to, um, to um, Interstellar was Kip Thorne, who just won the Nobel Prize for this work. Oh. We talked about it. I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, so, so, okay. So, so, you know, so let, me, let, me give you, let me give you two answers to that. Um, one, one is the, so the question was, uh, why is it useful to know this? So Michael Faraday, who was an English physicist in the early 1800s, discovered the phenomenon of electromagnetic induction, whereby, it sounds complicated, where you move a magnet near electrical wires and you make electricity. Well, it's the basis of all the electric generators that generate 99.9% .9 of all the electricity in the world today. But someone asked him, what good is this? And he said, I don't know, but you will surely find a way to tax it. <laughs> so there's, so there's, there's one answer. So, you know, I, and so, I can, so I can give you one practical answer. GPS would not work accurately if we didn't know general relativity. I can give you another answer. If you're an astrophysicist or cosmologist interested in understanding the universe as a large scale system, only general relativity correctly describes it on the large scale. 
If you're an everyday person wondering why you're being asked to cough up the tax bill to the National Science Foundation to fund these things, well, you know, then you start getting philosophical. Is it good for humankind to understand more about the universe it lives in? Does it give us, you know, a sense of wonder? A sense, does it, you know, and, and I'm, my answer would be yes. Uh, will there sometime be applications of this? I'm sure there will be. Um, there already are with this GPS example. But, um, and, or, you know, astronomers using it now to do other things, like discover Earth-like planets because of gravitational lensing. Well, yeah, so, so, you know. Just to clarify. Just, uh, doubting the yeah. Of no, I understand. But it, I think it's a good question. It needs to keep being raised. You know, what's the point of science? Um, and I think there are many answers to be given. And the deepest, most philosophical is it gives us a sense of wonder about the universe we live in. It's almost a religious sense. And, and uh, you know, that to me is the first reason for doing it. Can you talk about the progression of telescopes? Mm -hmm that we might be able to, or might hope to be able to see with a gravitational version that we couldn't see with the glass version? That's a good question. Um, so we, the first answer is we've seen black holes collide and merge. And there is no, that, that is something we are probably, at least not in the foreseeable future, going to be able to see with any other kind of telescope. I mean, these aren't exactly telescopes, but they sort of are. They're ast astronomical instruments. Um, that one that's going to be three million miles on a, on a side is going to detect a whole range of, I mean, it will detect, uh, what will it detect? I think it will detect binary star systems going around each other, detect a number of sort of more mundane things. Um, is there some totally new phenomenon in the universe that these things will detect? There well, could well be. Every one of those new astronomies I showed you opened up a new window and we discovered, you know, we thought there were stars and they shined. And then we discover there are quasars and there are neutrons. There's all these things that we didn't know existed. The theorists predicted they might exist. And then these new astronomies discover them. And sometimes the new astronomy discovered something like gamma ray bursts that we didn't know what they were coming from until we started looking. So I think we will discover new things that we don't even know are there. I mean, this gravitational wave astronomy is, uh, if you think of it, really doing astronomy with it, started last June. It's four or five months old. A long ways to go. Uh, why is the speed of light constant? Um, well, uh, the easiest answer I can give you, I, I, the speed of light is invariant in the sense that everybody who measures it measures the same thing. Um, the least satisfying, most philosophically deep answer is if you truly believe that the laws of physics are the same for everyone and you look at the laws of physics, particularly the laws of electromagnetism that James Clerk Maxwell uh, articulated in, during the time of the American Civil War, basically. Uh, they predict that there should be waves of electromagnetism, and they predict a speed, namely the speed of light. And if you believe that that set of laws of physics, like every other law of physics, has to be true for every observer, then everyone has to find the same value for the speed of light. So I use the word invariant, meaning it doesn't vary from one state of motion or one point of view to another. Um, it's also constant. It doesn't change in different parts of the universe. Um, you will occasionally hear people talking about distant objects that seem to be moving faster than light and other things. And there are issues when you look at very distant objects over regions where space-time is curved. But if you sit locally in a laboratory and measure the speed of light, no matter how that laboratory is moving, you'll get 180. You'll get 299792458 meters per second exactly. That's how the meter is defined, by the way. So, um, so the, the least satisfying answer but philosophically deepest is all, everybody has to see the same physics. And part of physics is the prediction of these waves going at this speed. Now you might say, why isn't that true for sound waves? Because if I come toward you and you're talking, the sound waves are coming to me faster. But the sound waves are disturbances of air. So we know, understand that. And the idea that physicists had in the 1800s was that light waves were disturbances of some stuff. And they set out to find that stuff. They called it the ether. And stuff doesn't exist. Light waves travel in vacuum. They don't have any stuff. Vacuum isn't a substance. So you can't talk about how fast they're moving relative to the vacuum. They move at speed c relative to any observer who cares to measure them, because the laws of physics have to be the same. So that's why it's invariant. You questioned science 
what are the practical effects of all the stuff you've been talking about? Yeah. Well, one of them is we have the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yes, <laughs> and I was just noting, Douglas Adams is right here on this shelf. <laughs> no, no. You had a question. I know I'm supposed to get you out of here by 8.30, so I got... You know. I know many, many scientists work on these discoveries. I'm wondering if the scientists agree on an overarching goal of all of this work. Uh, well, I think... You know, I think the goal, and, and Kip Thorne particularly, and a couple of the others who won the Nobel Prize, they've been working on this for 30 years, thinking of this idea. The first idea was to let's make sure Einstein was right on this one too. And they knew that if they could detect these things, you know, and there were generations of scientists who tried before them and failed with these big aluminum bars and stuff, and earlier versions of LIGO didn't work either, they weren't sensitive enough, they knew that if they could detect them, they would open a whole new window on phenomena in the universe like you were asking about. Um, so I think that they, I think they're in agreement that that's the goal. Let's let's develop a new way of studying the universe. In the process, let's confirm this wonderful idea Einstein had in his brain a hundred years ago, with no possible hope in his time of detecting them. Well, thank you all for coming. I enjoyed it, and. Um, <laughs> <laughs>